It's a proper name. If it weren't for the Romans, I couldn't have driven here because the Romans built some of the first paved roads. They had to. They didn't have four-wheel drive ox cars, though they did have steel-belted radio horseshoes. They invented other stuff, too. Uh, the Romans, not the oxen. So let's investigate. Go, go, gadget field trip. This is huge, but it used to be huger, uh, I mean, bigger. The Roman Empire used to stretch all the way from what is now England to the tip of Africa. If it stretched any further, it would have snapped. That's Italy, right there. The one in the middle of Europe, shaped like a boot. Now, 1800 years later, Rome has shrunk down to be a city this big. Wowzer! The Romans built lots of sporting arenas. Of course, hand-to-hand -hand combat with a line isn't considered a sport anymore. Much to the line's dismay. But they were used for other sports, too. Let's investigate the most famous arena, the Colosseum. I know it's around here somewhere. Aha! This is the Colosseum, a Roman ruin. A ruin is what's left standing after a famous building collapses. Actually, it's what's left standing after a not-so-famous building collapses, too. But those aren't too popular with the tourists. If this is what's left, the Colosseum must have been huge. The Colosseum didn't always look like a lot of rocks and rubble. It was all put together completely round with four stories of seats for people to watch the action, or just sit and gab if there was no game that day. It looked more like this. The floor of the arena was made up of boards and then covered with sand. In fact, the old Roman term for sand is arena. Sound familiar? That is where we get the term arena today, as in, let's go watch the football game at the sand, eh, <laughs> arena. Under all that sand, there was a complicated system of mazes and cages where the animals waiting to do battle were kept. You can still see the maze today, sort of like the bullpen in baseball, but with lines. Specially trained slaves called gladiators Bought exotic beasts from all over the world, like hippopotami and panthers. And that was considered a good job for a slave. This is what Rome was like today. 
But if you use your imagination, you can see the city the way it was almost 2,000 years ago. Would you believe Circus Maximus means big circle? Would you believe a three-ring circus? How about two clowns juggling pizzas? Actually, Circus Maximus does mean a big circle, and it was used as a track for chariot races. It was Rome's answer to the Indy 500, with horses instead of race cars, and Romans in plumed helmets instead of races and crash helmets. Chariot races weren't quite as fast, but they used a lot less gasoline. This place could hold almost 250,000 people before the floor fell in. Wowzers, that's a lot of pepperoni and pasta on a stick. Here's an Inspector Gadget field trip fact. Some of the chariot racers, or charioteers as they were called, even became famous. A charioteer named Diocles retired a millionaire. And that's without doing commercials for chariot racing sandals. Wowzers! Why are all these people putting their hands inside a monster's mouth? That's either a strange Roman manicure or a very scenic ATM machine. Actually, they're tourists. Legend has it that if a visitor puts his hand inside the monster's mouth and tells a lie, the monster will chomp down, which is not very friendly. Maybe he just nibbles your nails for a little white lie, or tickles your toenails for a fib. In fact, the monster's appetite for liars is where the statue gets its name. The Romans call it Boca de la Verite which is Old Roman for Mouth of Truth. And that's no lie. Honest. Rome is full of surprises, like this building. Its door is shaped like the mouth of another monster ready to eat all incoming visitors. And the windows look like smaller monsters watching as you enter. Wouldn't it have been easier to put up a no trespassing sign? Let's take a trip on the oldest road in Rome. It's so old, the road signs have wrinkles. The name of this road is the Appian Way. It's also called the Queen of Roads. Wonder where the king is? Actually, Her Majesty the Road is probably one of the oldest roads in the world. The Appian Way was the central road to which all other roads were connected. If all roads lead to Rome, this is the road they led to. the Romans was how to get around such a wide area. All these different provinces were connected by a huge system of roads. As new roads were added, it became more and more complex, which led to another Roman invention, the traffic jam. Let's get a horse's eye view of the city. Look out for the world's oldest potholes. Ouch! The Romans developed a system of underground tunnels and pipes that moved water all over Rome, feeding many of Rome's famous water fountains. They were among the first to have running water in their city. Sometimes it wasn't possible to install underground tunnels or pipes. The Romans solved that problem with an invention called aqueducts, though they didn't have feathers and hardly ever quacked. An aqueduct is an above-ground waterway. Any Roman mistaking these for roads was in for an early Roman water slide. Go, go, gadget swim fins! Yeah! Huge arches were built with channels on top that carried water all over the city. What did the Romans do with all that water? 
maybe they should have started the first bottled water company. If you were a rich person or patrician in the days of the Roman Empire, you would have enjoyed a warm bath, having the water piped or aqueducted straight into your house to your own private bath. Bubbles were optional. Those are either leaky aqueducts or very public baths. Actually, those are public fountains so the not-so-rich could have access to water. The water was sent to hundreds of fountains around the city, both for decoration and for public drinking water. A lot of these fountains are still in use today, from the beautifully sculpted fountains of Rome's courtyards and squares to simple streams of water for drinking and washing. These non-stop taps are called Roman noses. I guess it's okay that these noses are running. This fancy fountain is called the Trevi Fountain. People come from around the world to throw coins into this fountain for good luck. Legend has it that if you throw in a coin, one day you'll return to the fountain. Probably to get your coin back. Here's another Inspector Gadget field trip fact. Water, water everywhere, but not a bar of soap to be found. Instead of soap, Romans would clean themselves with oil, which was then scraped off with a device called a strigil. It was the Romans who found out oil and water definitely do not mix. Would you believe we're on our way to more Roman adventures? Would you believe a quick toga tour? How about a pizza party? The people of Rome have something most other major cities don't have, a lot of Romans. They also have two downtown, which makes getting directions a little iffy. Let's find out why. Go, go, Gadget Mobile! This is the old downtown of the old city of Rome. The Romans don't call it downtown, they call it the Roman Forum, which is Roman for more. People would come here to shop, gossip, even to hear some slippery politicians speak from the rostra or podium that was a permanent part of the forum. Fortunately, the invention of the bullhorn was a few thousand years off. Here's Rome's other downtown. This is where today's Romans hang out, especially the shoppers. Most of these buildings are still standing and the politicians aren't as slippery since they invented soap. One of the most hidden secrets in Rome is their graveyard. How can you hide a graveyard? Simple, put it underground. Ancient Rome had a very strange law. Not the one about no bathing your pigs in the aqueduct. This one said burials were not allowed within the city. So Romans built a place just outside the city limits for burial sites. It's called the catacombs. Sure is dark in here. This is an underground honeycomb of tombs where Christians buried their dead. Inside these tombs are early popes and martyrs, some of Rome's most important Christian citizens. There are also beautiful statues inside the catacombs. But where are the cats? It's nice to be back among the living. It's back on the Appian Way with the old inspector. Oof! in that pothole! Rome has a lot of secrets, and one of its best-kept secrets for a long time was a secret country 
completely hidden inside a city. I find that hard to believe. Let's investigate. Behind these huge walls is a completely separate country that's not part of Rome or even Italy. This is Vatican City, the only country in the world to be hidden inside the capital city of another country. In fact, Vatican City is also the smallest country in the world, which explains how they could fit it in a city. The entire world country is only one half of one square mile. Time for an Inspector Gadget field trip quiz. Who is this man? A, the Bishop of Rome. B, the head of Vatican City. Or C, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. The answer is all three. I told you Rome was full of secrets. Okay, it's not the riddle of the Sphinx, but it's something. This is Pope John Paul II. This guy wears a lot of hats, including a swell beanie. Like the leader of any country, the Pope has his own guards. But these are no ordinary bodyguards. For one thing, they don't hire out on weekends to protect rock stars. They're from Switzerland, and they're called the Swiss Guard. There are special requirements for becoming a Swiss Guard. You must be an unmarried man between the ages of 19 and 25. You must be a Roman Catholic citizen of Switzerland. You must be at least six feet two inches tall. And you must be able to yodel in seven languages. Just kidding about the yodeling. If you meet all of these criteria, you not only guard the head of Vatican City, but you also learn judo, karate, and wear snappy tights. The uniforms worn by the Swiss guards are very special. They were reportedly designed by the world-famous artist Michelangelo. But this was not Michelangelo's only contribution to Vatican City. Michelangelo also designed the dome of St. Peter's Church. St. Peter's Church is the largest church in the world. Compared to the country it's in, St. Peter's is so big that the equivalent in the United States would be a church the size of Pennsylvania. Designing the dome, the Pope told Michelangelo to take a rest, so he did. He lay on his back for four years and painted the ceiling. The ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is the most famous ceiling in the world. Michelangelo had to climb rickety scaffolding and he painted lying on his back looking straight up. I guess he got used to paint drops in his mouth. After painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo was so used to working at that bizarre angle that he had to hold letters and papers above his head and look up to read them. Vatican City has its own money and its own bank. Wowzers! It's like this place is a country. Wait a minute. It is a country. That's why it has its own flag, its own post office, and even its own museum. It also has its own radio station. In fact, more people work at the Vatican radio station than live in Vatican City. The radio station broadcasts the addresses of the Pope around the world in over 30 languages, including Italian, English, and Japanese. The Vatican also has its own fire department and even a train station. Wowzers, this place has everything. If they get any bigger, they'll have to build underground. Time to hop back on the 
Appian Way and head for our next adventure. Oof. Will somebody please fix that pothole? We've uncovered a lot of secrets here in Rome. We've seen where ancient gladiators gladiated, taken the early Roman lie detector test, borrowed three coins from a fountain, and marched with the Swiss guards at the Vatican. All in one city. Arrivederci Roma. Until next time, go, go, gadget field trip. Do 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 do